During the Battle of Europe, fog greatly hampered Allied bombers. The fog hazard was whipped by Operation FIDO, Fog Investigation Dispersal Operation. The installation consists of horizontal pipes laid parallel to each side of a landing strip. Torches are used to light the pipes, two of which are laid on the ground and one above them. Petroleum is pumped into the upper pipe and flows into the lower ones, which have tiny holes at short intervals. As these lower pipes are ignited, a wall of flame bursts from the tiny jets. The intense heat first vaporizes the fuel in the upper or feeder pipe, causing the smoke to subside. Then, as the air above the field is heated, the thickest fog is evaporated. Within 10 minutes, a space 1,000 yards long by 1,500 feet wide and 100 feet high can be cleared. The petroleum burns at a rate of 20 gallons a yard of burner an hour and must raise the air temperature 7 degrees Fahrenheit to get clear visibility. About 30 million gallons of fuel were used up to VE day. In calm conditions involving ground fog, Clearances of more than 500 feet high have been obtained in six minutes. In more difficult conditions involving cloud or sea fog and high winds, it's sometimes difficult to reach as high as 100 feet. Fido helped smash Marshal von Rundstedt's Ardennes offensive when, despite the heavy fog that blanketed English airfields, RAF pathfinders were enabled to fly from the British Isles and mark targets for the bombing of German supplies. Dredging operations at Bremerhaven, Germany to facilitate the passage of troop ships out of the port. This job is an extremely large basin described as the only location where the 50,000 ton Europa can turn around and head out to sea. 20,000 cubic feet of sludge are removed per day. It's estimated three months will be required to dredge the entire turning basin. On 16th June, the Europa is maneuvered to dry dock where she'll be converted for use as an American troop ship. Inspection and repairs will take about five weeks. The only war damage to the $16 million former luxury liner occurred in 1940 when an RAF night raider dropped a small bomb between her funnels. Air views of redeployment camps of the ETO Assembly Area Command. Grouped in four clusters around the city of Reims in northern France are 17 camps with 33,000 tents and 5,000 huts covering 3,200 square miles. The purpose of this establishment is to serve as a reservoir for the coastal staging areas and as a central point for checking equipment and personnel records. Troops going to the United States are expected to remain 15 to 20 days. Those going to the Pacific will remain 25 to 40 days to allow their equipment to precede them on slower ships. Each camp holds about 15,000 men. Camps are named after American cities. At Camp Washington, Cisson sub-area, elements of the 3736th Heavy Truck Company arrives from Paris on 11th June. Under a speed-up plan announced by the Army, the redeployment of men and equipment directly from Europe to the Pacific is now expected to be largely completed by October. Transportation of litter cases over terrain which is inaccessible to vehicles may require up to four men. Often it is difficult for medical corpsmen to penetrate jungle growth or climb hills and ravines. Because of this, the Army has adopted a one-man carry, which requires no equipment other than that normally worn by two soldiers. Cartridge belts are used to make a sling. One belt is put under the thighs. The victim's simulated broken leg has already been placed in a rifle splint. The other belt is slipped under the small of the back. This field expedient for rapid removal of a casualty by only one man is learned easily. The participants in the demonstration now in progress are actually doing it for the first time. After both belts are in position, they are joined together. Cartridge belts are recommended for the job, although rifle slings, other belts, or bandages may be used.
Next, the buckles are slipped under the wounded man so that two smooth loops are formed. These loops will fit over the shoulders of the man who is doing the carrying. Now it's necessary to get the loops over the shoulders. This is done rapidly by following a simple procedure. Lying down in the manner shown, he's able to slip his arms through the loops and secure an unbreakable hold on the casualty. Here's the way it's accomplished. When he's sure his position is firm, the soldier rolls over, pulling the wounded man on top of him. Naturally, he rolls over on the uninjured side of the casualty. The final step is to get up from the ground and begin the trek to an aid station. The one-man carry is a Russian method which women medical personnel were able to master and perform without undue difficulty. This carry has proved itself easier on a wounded man than any other improvisation when a litter is not available. It can be used for almost every injury except an abdominal wound. Also, the carrier has the advantage of free use of his hands to aid in climbing. He can even use his rifle if necessary. Because it requires no extra equipment or detailed training, it is expected that the one-man carry will see widespread use in the Pacific combat area. The 155 mm gun motor carriage M40, developed by ordinance to provide mobility for the standard M2 weapon popularly known as the Long Tom. Maximum speed is 24 miles an hour. The 155 is mounted on an armored chassis using the components of the M4 Sherman tank. However, as the M40 draws up alongside the Sherman, it can be seen that the new vehicle is longer and wider. The suspension is of the horizontal volute spring type with a center guide 23-inch track. The self-propelled mount is identical in every way to the regulation 155, including top carriage, recoil, traversing, and elevating mechanism. The gun can be elevated from minus 5 to plus 52 degrees. It can be traversed 18 degrees to the right and 16 degrees to the left. Power is supplied by a continental radial air-cooled engine through a constant mesh synchronized transmission. In addition to the driver and chief of section, there are 10 men in the crew. Four ride in the M4 tractor, which together with the M23 ammunition trailer, carries 144 rounds of ammunition. Tractor and trailer accompany the carriage wherever it goes. Opening the door at the rear of the trailer to show the ammunition stowage compartment. In addition, there's space for 20 ready rounds on the gun motor carriage itself. The M40 drives out to the firing range, followed by the tractor and trailer. By this means, heavy artillery can be brought into action in a minimum of time to support a rapidly moving situation. Ordnance lists the M40 as the successor to the gun motor carriage M12. For firing, the M40 is stabilized by means of a spade which is dropped and seated in the ground by backing the vehicle. 43 seconds are required to set up in firing position. The M40 fires the standard 95 pound projectile up to 25,400 yards at a maximum muzzle velocity of 2,800 feet per second. The 
The same carriage is used for the 8-inch howitzer. Its nomenclature is Motor Carriage T-89. The top carriages and weapons of the two vehicles are interchangeable. Both are examples of the present tendency toward more mobile artillery. Borneo is invaded for the second time as Australian troops land on the northwest part of the island. General Douglas MacArthur directs the amphibious invasion while units of the U.S. 7th Fleet and an Australian squadron shell the area. Invasion craft head for Labuan Island Beach. 9th Australian Division troops land on Labuan Island, Mora Island, and at Brookton, terminal point of a coastal road from the capital city of Brunei. The invasion takes the enemy by surprise, and only scattered opposition is offered by Jap forces. General MacArthur, Allied Commander-in-Chief in the Pacific area, goes ashore with the invasion troops on Labuan Island. He's accompanied by Rear Admiral Forrest B. Royal, American Fleet Commander, General George C. Kenney, Commander of the Far Eastern Air Force, and Lieutenant General Sir Leslie Mooreshead, Senior Australian Officer. The landings follow a three-day naval bombardment and weeks of pounding from the air. Labuan dominates the northern entrance to Brunei Bay. The surrounding area has 250 square miles of protected deep water anchorage, important air bases, and oil, rubber, coal, lumber, and iron. Generals MacArthur and Mooreshead watch Australian tanks and infantry drive Japs from the hills and underbrush. The Australians quickly capture Victoria Town and Harbour. General MacArthur goes ashore on the southwestern corner of Brunei Bay. The Australians capture Brookton and then drive toward Brunei. As two columns converge on Brunei, General MacArthur states that the enemy has definitely lost the war of strategy in the southwest Pacific. The Allied commander greets an Australian commander leading units near Brunei. Occupation of the Borneo coasts intensifies our blockade of the Japanese conquered empire. Advance on northern Luzon. Troops of the 37th Division, supported by tanks, tank destroyers, and half-tracks, move ahead on National Highway No. 5, a road which runs through the Cagayan Valley to Apari, last Jap escape port on Luzon. Our troops run into enemy fire from Jap positions in the wooded areas and hills bordering the highway. Tanks and infantry wipe out Japs holding up our advance. The swift push northward through the valley averages 10 miles a day. The main enemy resistance is offered by snipers and small bodies of troops hidden along the road. Elements of the 37th Division move to contact Filipino guerrillas who have captured the Cagayan province capital of Tugegarao, thus splitting Jap forces in the valley. Firing M51 quadruple 50 caliber machine guns. Japs killed during a night counterattack. Troops move ahead to relieve the besieged guerrillas at Tugegarao. Elements of the 37th Division crossed the Magat River Bridge after forward patrols of the 145th Regiment had cleaned out snipers. Many Jap prisoners are taken in our rapid advance through the Cagayan Valley. In one 24-hour period, the 129th Regiment captures the largest group of Jap prisoners taken in the Pacific fighting prior to the mass surrenders on Okinawa. 165 soldiers give themselves up, bringing the total number captured in the Cagayan Valley fighting to 1,341. 125 laborers brought from Formosa are also taken prisoner. 
Many of the prisoners suffer from malnutrition, proving the effectiveness of our blockade, which has compelled the enemy to live off the land. Some of the prisoners are too weak to stand as they line up for questioning. Dazed, ill-equipped, and lacking food, the Japs have been unable to put up any strong resistance. Aerial attacks have disrupted Japanese supply lines, which have also been harassed by Filipino guerrillas. Prisoners are questioned and then loaded onto trucks for removal to the rear. The seizure of the northern Luzon port of Apari by U.S. 6th Army units, Igorot guerrillas, and troops of the 11th Airborne Division in a move coordinated with the 37th Division advance closes the last Jap escape route in the north. These northern elements moving south toward the 37th trap an estimated 20 to 30,000 Jap troops in the Cagayan Valley. Capture of strategic Tuga Garao by elements of the 37th Division further splits up Jap forces in the area, forcing the enemy into small pockets which can be easily liquidated and bringing to a close the Luzon campaign. Major General Roy F. Geiger and the late Lieutenant General Simon B. Bruckner on Okinawa. General Geiger assumed temporary command of the American forces in the Ryukyus Island on 18th June when a Jap shell killed General Buckner. General Buckner with General Joseph W. Stilwell upon the latter's arrival on Okinawa early in June to confer on problems involved in the retraining of ground forces for the Pacific War. Former Chief of Army Ground Forces holds a press conference after being appointed to take over General Buckner's last command as head of the 10th Army. Tanks move up to new positions in fighting for the escarpment known as Hill 92. Tank flamethrowers try to reach machine gun nests dug in high up on the side of the hill. Covered by machine guns, a tank moves up the steep slope of the lower escarpment under continuous sniper fire from Japs higher up the hill. The tank flames are fired into a cave to silence an enemy machine gun. An extension hose is strung from a tank's flamethrower up the hill to the top of the escarpment. A Jap emerges from a cave and starts toward our lines. Wounded several days before in the foot, the Jap slowly makes his way toward our forward position on the hill under the watchful eyes of several infantrymen. As the fighting on the island enters its final weeks and the enemy situation deteriorates, surrender by the Japs remains sporadic. Group surrenders do not begin until the fighting is almost over. Wearing the uniform of an officer, the Jap uses a slight knowledge of English to give himself up. A slip of paper carried by the prisoner bears a request in English asking that he be given food, water, and medical attention. Earlier in the day, the Jap was badly burned on the neck, head, and arms by one of our flamethrowers. After being searched for hidden weapons, the prisoner is given food and water. While waiting for medical care, he's given a preliminary questioning. It's discovered that the Jap is a first lieutenant in the Katsuda Batai, a Japanese naval unit assigned to defend the hill. The prisoner is taken to the 1st Battalion Aid Station for medical attention and a thorough interrogation by a 7th Division interpreter and the 32nd Regiment's S-2.
Navy gun camera films of carrier aircraft striking Jap installations in the Ryukyus. Shipping and harbor facilities are hit in daily neutralization sorties north and south of Okinawa. Japanese aircraft headed for attacks on American fleet units. From the beginning of the Okinawa operations to 2nd June, more than 1,400 enemy planes have been destroyed. These are additional scenes during the height of the kamikaze raids around Okinawa. Carriers and other surface vessels barely escaped Jap planes plunging through heavy ACAC. elements taking part in these actions is the Bunker Hill, flagship of Vice Admiral Mitcher's fast carrier task force. Following the suicide attacks, Navy aircraft return to their carriers from the rocket and strafing runs. One plane drops its belly tank. Pilot is rescued and hoses go to work on the burning craft. Spraying fomite on the exploded gas tank. The smoking ship in the distance is the Bunker Hill. She's been hit twice by suicide planes on the morning of 11th May. Fires and exploding ammunition sweep her decks. Men who were blown over the side of the carrier or escaped from burning planes by jumping overboard are picked up by whale boats. Then they're taken aboard a DD, which has quickly come to the rescue. Other destroyers and the cruiser Wilkesbury are alongside the Bunker Hill, playing their hoses on the flaming CV. The 27,000-ton Essex-class carrier was first hit by a Zeke, which dropped a 500-pound delayed action bomb and then crashed among 34 planes ready for takeoff on the flight deck. Seconds later, a Judy let go another 500-pounder, which penetrated the after-flight deck and exploded in the gallery deck immediately below. The Judy crashed at the base of the ship's island superstructure. Casualties number 373 killed, 264 wounded, 19 missing. The fire is brought under control in four hours and the Bunker Hill is able to sail home under her own power. Air Force films of mass incendiary strikes on Japanese industrial targets. 3,200 tons are unloaded over Kobe in a 5th June raid by more than 450 superforts. The incendiaries hit throughout the entire area of the long, narrow city, avoiding only the three-mile square strip west of the shipyards, burned out in two previous attacks. Greatest concentrations are achieved in a seven-square-mile area in the eastern section of the city, which includes the Kobe Steelworks. Kobe, which is Japan's sixth largest city and principal shipping center, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and Yokohama are struck in B-29 incendiary assaults during the month of June. 100 square miles are devastated by the fire raids on these industrial areas. On 15th June, anniversary of the first B-29 attack on Japan, an announcement regarding future all-out bombing is made by General H.H. H. Arnold, commanding General Army Air Forces, and chief of the 20th Air Force. General Arnold says that beginning 1st July, industrial Japan will be hit at the rate of 2 million tons a year, 
for 5,480 tons a day. He adds that by the end of 1946, Japan will have ceased to exist as a bombing target. 